Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Is that on? Can you hear? Good afternoon. I'm Harriet Watson, president of the City Club of Portland. And you're not. I've been waiting a whole year to do that. <laughs> and I was certain when the mic was dead that someone had seen the advanced copy of my script. <laughs> it's with great pleasure that I welcome you today on this my last day as president of the City Club of Portland to a very special annual meeting program with guest speaker Daniel Shore. To begin this year's annual meeting, Dan Findlay, member of the Board of Governors and co-chair of the Issue Committee Chairs, has some important presentations to make. Dan? Thank you, Harriet. One of the wonderful things about being on the Board of Governors is at least once a year, you get to give something really cool away. And that's what I get to do today. The Issue Committees are described as the eyes and ears of the City Club. And you could take it even further than that and say that they are to an extent the mouth, the heart, the hands, the feet, the people who make the telephone calls. The people who are in issues committees know what I'm talking about. If you've never had an opportunity to serve on an issue committee and you are a member of City Club, I strongly suggest, whoa, <laughs> cool. <laughs> strongly recommend that you select a committee of your interest and get involved. If you're not a member of City Club, uh, be advised the doors have been secured. You will not be allowed to leave until you sign up. <laughs> now I have the privilege of giving away some uh, very nice plaques to some people who are leaving after giving wonderful service to the issue committees that I'll name. Uh, first of all, we have a gentleman who is co-chair of Public Services and Safety Committee, Mr. Erwin Mandel, leaving. Come on up, Erwin. And now, departing as co-chair of Growth Management and the Environment Committee, Mr. Bruce Pearson. Is Bruce with us today? Super. My marketing coordinator gave me a very extensive lesson on what to do when I'm doing this. Shake below, hand the plaque, talk to the person. So I'm working on that. Am I doing okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Departing co-chair of Education and Human Development, Melissa Ritter. Is Melissa with us today? <laughs> Margaret Eichmann is going to be departing as co-chair of Arts and Culture and was not able to be with us today. We wish her well and hope to see her back very soon in the future. And the last plaque I'll be handing out today goes to the departing co-chair of the Health Care Committee, Ms. Carrie Stanley. Is Carrie with us today? And thank you very much. Harry? Thanks, Dan, and thanks to all the committee chairs for their very important work during the course of the past year. You should have on your tables today some advanced copies of the City Club's 2001 annual report, and they are being mailed to you later this week. I think it serves as an important reminder for the ongoing value of what this club and its members do. Especially noteworthy this year, are the high quality Friday programs, research efforts, and new program initiatives. To that end, I'd like to extend thanks to all of our active members and to the City Club staff 
with a very special note of thanks to communications manager Stephanie Stevens for the exceptional quality of this year's annual report. Before we proceed with the elections of officers and governors, it's my privilege to recognize those members who are rotating off the board today. Please hold your applause, whistles, cheers, stompings until the last person has been recognized. As I read your names, please come forward to receive a token of our appreciation, or I think in the interest of time, I'll just do a little swivel and hand them to you. Andy Linehan, I don't know if Andy's here. There. Andy's always right behind me. <laughs> Andy's completing a three-year term, and he has ably served as co-chair of the issue committee chairs and currently sits on the program committee. Um, someone wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Les Swanson, Les has served as first vice president of the club and chair of the research board. And David Kish has just done invaluable service and he is completing a two-year term as club treasurer. We can applaud now. Two of our members have had to leave the board in midterm, but we are very thankful for the contributions they have made during their abbreviated tenure, and we hope they will remain very good friends of the City Club. Nan Newell is with us today, and she chaired the program committee for the past year. Kay Turan ably served as vice chair of the program committee and is unable to be with us today. Nan, we have a small token of appreciation for you today. The City Club Member of the Year Award will be given out at a subsequent meeting. Please join me in giving all of our club leaders a very enthusiastic round of applause. My last official act as City Club President is to preside over the election of the 2001-2002 officers and governors. First, I'd like to introduce our returning members of the board who are seated in the back row. And they are Stephen Schneider, Rector of Grace Memorial Episcopal Church, Jane Cease, retired legislator, Arnold Kogan, managing partner, Kogan's Owens Kogan, and Dan Findlay, computer specialist with learning.com. Returning board member Joey Pope is unable to be with us today. Will all of you please stand and we will recognize you with a round of applause. We will now proceed with the election of the 2001-2002 officers and governors. To my immediate left is Patty Tillett, principal with the Zimmer Gunzel Frasca Partnership. And as of today, Patty becomes president from his position as president-elect. Next to Patty is our special guest, Daniel Shore. Patty will give him a fuller introduction shortly. Next is Susan Kelly, assistant to City Commissioner Charlie Hales, who is nominated for the position of president-elect. Next to Susan is Kurt Krauss, retired high-tech administrator and nominee for the Board of Governors. Next to Kurt is Cather Carol Witherill, Professor of Education at Lewis and Clark College. Carol has just completed an unfinished term as governor and is nominee for a regular three-year term. And next to Carol is Katie King, Intergovernmental Liaison for the Oregon Health Department. To my immediate right is Brad Avakian, attorney in private practice and nominee for governor. To his left, to his right, is Jenny Cooper, is not Jenny Cooper, is Coraline Kraft, realtor with Hassan and Company and nominee for governor. I'm just going to look at my, the table instead of the script. Um, and then there's, of course, Tom uh, Deering, 
a retired attorney with Stoll Reeves Law Firm, and he has just completed an um, unfinished term and is being nominated for a regular three-year term, and he's a regular kind of guy. And there's Jenny Cooper, director of the Multnomah County Libraries and nominee for treasurer. Um, Doug Marker, nominee for vice president, is unable to be with us today. I'm going to do fast forward on this. The nominees have been selected by the club's nominating committee according to the bylaws. There is a mechanism which allows other nominations from the membership provided three written recommendations from club members and a signed agreement from the nominee is submitted within 10 days of the annual meeting. No other names have been submitted for election and I therefore declare the nominees elected by unanimous consent. Congratulations all. A very special thanks to Corlene Kraft, who chaired the nominating committee this year. Corlene, you did an outstanding job, and I wish you all a very productive and rewarding year. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize City Club's outstanding staff. As any of us who work with volunteers know, that's always an exciting challenge, and especially when you're working with really smart volunteers. So to Nancy Adine, Executive Director, Paul Leisner, Research Director, uh, Stephanie Stevens, Communications Manager, and Suzanne Jeffries, Office Manager, thank you very much. <laughs> Just a brief announcement for those of you who are part of the Intrepid City Club Mount Hood Ascent team. It has been postponed from this evening until Friday, June 15th. Before I formally turn the program over to Patty, I'd like to extend my personal thanks to all of you for the opportunity to serve as president this past year. As I wrote in my annual report letter, it's been both an exhilarating and sobering experience. And for those of you who have witnessed some of my more memorable gaffes, from this podium, a sometimes humbling experience. I leave my year as president with my commitment to the City Club both strengthened and reaffirmed. At a time when rational civic discourse on public issues seems all but forgotten, the role of City Club is arguably more important now than ever. City Club is and has always been a place where ideas matter where there's an intersection of public and personal values and a willingness to make hard choices and accept inevitable trade-offs. In a wonderfully perverse way, City Club members and staff don't think the work is really fun unless it's really hard. And I think we're all in for having a lot of fun. <laughs> City Club helps us identify what's important to think about without telling us what to think. We have to do that on our own. And at its best, the work of City Club is unrelentingly critical of our broader community in the most positive and useful sense of that word. It's about being constantly vigilant and not letting ourselves be lulled into complacency. During this graduation season, I was thinking that in some ways, Portland and the entire region has had a 10 or 20 year all night party. And it's now, suddenly, the morning after. Some of us are a little sleepy. We might have a little bit of a headache. We have some great memories. We've received some good and some not so good grades. And there's limitless potential for us to actively envision and shape our future. These are incredibly exciting and challenging times and I look forward to supporting with you the ongoing work of the City Club of Portland. It's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to President Patty Tillett. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Harriet. <clears throat> For a whole year now, we've benefited from your clarity of direction and generosity of spirit. You set out to give greater definition to the pursuit of the City Club mission and to find ways of improving everything that the club does. 
and your diligence and determination have certainly brought great success in that time. Perhaps most importantly, you've been very good at making the board and the staff function very efficiently and effectively together. That's perhaps the most important thing uh, um, that the president can do. And in identifying and accomplishing a whole series of objectives through the year, all this was done with deftness of, and humor, as you've witnessed. So you've left the incoming president with the devil of an act to follow. <laughs> Had it's with great pleasure that I present you with this token on behalf of everyone at the club um, it, who has benefited from your hard work. And I'm not sure we can shake hands with this one. It's too oh. big. <laughs> Thank you very much. Whenever I ride past the Skidmore Fountain on Max, I squint out of the window hoping to catch sight of that marvelous inscription, good citizens are the riches of the city. In part, the mission of the City Club is about ensuring that we can meet Lewis Mumford's challenge, that our citizens are worthy of the marvelous city that we inhabit, and that tomorrow's citizens will care sufficiently to ensure the safety of our civic riches. In this regard, I've been particularly delighted by the participation in our Friday programs by students from Lincoln High School, from Oregon Episcopal School, and also from Portland State University. And I'd like to mention that Stowell Reeves has very kindly sponsored lunches for the Lincoln Constitutional Team during the coming year, which is very generous. But a broader look at our community is gloomy in the extreme. In our general elections last November, only 22% of eligible voters voted. And amongst the 18 to 20 to 34 year old voters, only 6%. Points of engagement and reasons for disenchantment and to devise strategies for re-engaging their generation. My hope is that topics and issues of greater relevance to younger members can be addressed by the City Club through our website, through inclusion in our Broadcast Friday programs, and through our research papers. There are several issues that manifestly do appeal to the full breadth of City Club membership. Among these, and of particular interest to me, is the built environment. Over the past two years, we've introduced some enormously popular Friday programs, extracurricular architectural programs and visits, and uh, have produced some landmark reports, such as those on development density and sustainability. The fabric of our city is universally admired. It's achieved that quality because it reflects the passionately held civic values of generations of good citizens. We live in an age in which those civic values are wavering dangerously. Over the coming year, I shall work diligently as your president, with what I'm delighted to report as an outstanding board of governors and staff, to reinstate the primacy of those values and to do everything in my power to ensure the succession of good citizens as the riches of our city. And now to today's program. Thank you. Um, seated to my left is Susan Kelly, who is our board host today and our new president-elect. She will ask the first question of um, Daniel Shaw. Following Susan's question, we'll open the floor to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up at the microphone while Susan's still asking her question and um, make your questions brief and to the point so we can make most of Daniel's time. 30 second limit, remember. Uh, broadcast of the City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from CH2M Hill, Providence Health Systems, and Warehouser Company Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. We owe the opportunity to hear from Daniel Shaw today to Elizabeth Shaw, who will be speaking at Lewis and Clark College graduate commencement this weekend and will also be receiving an honorary degree. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us today and thank you for loaning us your distinguished husband. To those of you who are avid NPR listeners, Daniel Shaw, of course, will need little introduction. 
But early in his long career, he earned a reputation as a tenacious and intelligent journalist, stacking up the first of an impressive collection of awards for his work. He's covered everything from the eisenhower Khrushchev meeting in Geneva in 1955 to the recent Clinton impeachment hearings. Established as one of the Murrow boys while covering the 1950s McCarthy witch hunt for Reds, Mr. Shaw was subsequently dispatched to Moscow to open a CBS bureau in 1955. Repeated defiance of Soviet censorship eventually got him into hot water with the KGB, who had him arrested and barred from the USSR in 1957, but not before he'd achieved the extraordinary coup of conducting the first exclusive television interview with Khrushchev himself. In 1972, the Watergate break-in uh, brought Shaw a full-time CBS assignment and onto Nixon's infamous enemies list and an order that he be subjected to an FBI investigation. So on that occasion, the hunter became the hunted. Having created the cable news network for Ted Turner in 1979, he served at its, as its senior correspondent until 1985, when he left over an effort to limit his editorial independence. Since then, Mr. Shaw has concentrated on broadcast for national public radio and on writing. In 1996, he was awarded broadcasting's highest honor, the Golden Baton, to crown his collection of Emmys and other prizes. Reviewers of his latest book, Staying Tuned, speak of clarity and eloquence and integrity. We might add patience to that list of virtues because we've sorely tried your patience today, Daniel. <laughs> but it's with enormous enthusiasm that we look forward now to hearing your first impressions of the Bush presidency. Please welcome Daniel Shaw. Thank you. Patty, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, um, when the PA system wasn't working, I tore up my speech. <laughs> <coughs> and so I'm left to simply communicate with you with whatever is left of an adult brain. Um, the introduction was so nice that I don't even know how to respond to it. We, after all, do live in an age when people are very down on the media and there's a great deal of media bashing and we're usually accustomed to being attacked rather than painted in those kind of extravagant terms that your new president painted me. It uh, sort of reminded me of how do you respond when you have to stand up and somebody has offered you an accolade. Well, how do you deal with that? When I, when I hear that, I always think back to the one who was great expert at that kind of thing, Henry Kissinger. Uh, <clears throat> And I say that uh, uh, because when Kissinger got the Nobel Peace Prize at a very large reception for him at the State Department, a woman walked up to him and looked into his eyes straight like that and took his hand in her two hands and said, Mr. Secretary, I simply wanted to thank you for saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked back at her without missing a beat and said, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I haven't saved the world, I haven't saved a small part of the world, but what I have done in, in a maybe the overly long career is I, I have tried to understand what the world is about and then try to explain it to people who need very badly to explain what becomes increasingly inexplicable. Now, you put me down to speak about my first impressions of the new administration. If that's my assignment, I've been accustomed to accepting assignments as they come. And so let's start there, and then, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my book later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Last week, um, President Bush was in California, this past week, his third foreign trip. <laughs> <laughs> I should like to speak, coming from Washington to here, I should really like to speak to you as somebody who knows him intimately and well. Uh, that would be a lie. I have never met him. And so in a sense, I have the same opportunity you have to judge him outwardly from television, 
from reading about him and learning what he does and trying to evaluate that. But that is kind of enough in its way to get a very good impression of what he's like during his first four months in office. He came into office talking bipartisanship and then acted in a very partisan fashion. He came into office talking about conservative, compassionate conservatism, and then pushed through a budget which made you wonder about the compassionate when you see how education, which he espouses, but he doesn't provide a lot of money for education, uh, the poor people whom he worries about, but most of the tax breaks go to the rich people, and you begin to wonder about what is there today that makes it so difficult to either explain or to accept someone whose outward credentials are so good. I was fascinated by the, by the uh, Jim Jeffords episode. I was fascinated by it. Of course, it caused an earthquake. It means a whole series of things and we'll be hearing more and more about the result of, the, of what happens now when Democrats take over the chairmanship of these important committees. If you, if you have, uh, for example, Joe Biden running the Foreign Relations Committee, you will see things change with Levin uh, in, uh, heading the Armed Services Committee. You could read even today that the administration is going to have much more trouble pushing through its missile defense program. We certainly learn the meaning of, of <clears throat> <clears throat> we begin to learn the meaning of things we never fully understood, that who sets the agenda has enormous and powerful influence. And even though we have an administration where you had Republican control of presidency, the Senate and the House, and now by the action of one person, suddenly all that turns. Why is that? Why is it, I mean, how is it that uh, a man like Jim Jeffords, who was uh, a little bit unhappy about what's been happening, he's been a Republican all his life, and now he finds it difficult because he's a moderate Republican and the administration has not made much room for moderates. They're beginning to learn, and I think they'll begin to change now. But the fact of the matter is that they thought they had it their own way. They controlled all these three branches of government, maybe the fourth branch, the Supreme Court also, but never mind. <laughs> no, really, no. I mean, he won, he won the election fair and square. <laughs> I mean, you know, he got all the American people spoke, all five of them. <laughs> But it is a phenomenon today in which things are so delicately poised that one man, one person, can change the whole picture and change it all around. What really has happened is that we find a perilous balance in our whole body politic today. I mean, you could get one senator changing the, who was in charge in the Senate, but it is more than that. It is that the population votes, they voted 49% this way, 48% that way. Vote after vote indicates that uh, Americans are either bored, listless, divided, polarized, alienated, and don't exactly know anymore what to make of the, of the process in which they live. Why, why is that? Well, in part it is, I think, because we live in the media age, when we don't have a feeling that seeing our state's people on television, we really know who they are and what they're about. We now know that there are consulting firms, that there are ways in which you can get people to say the, exactly the right things to appeal to the public. And you begin to feel, he's not telling me something, he's just playing back to me what I just told him. And that is not really governing. And so we get now the, the president, and we have this strange series of things that have been going on, as for example, president being a good conservative, he may not be compassionate, but he really is conservative, and, and being, being a good conservative says, oh, to, to hell with all the environmental stuff, and they're 
carbon dioxide stuff, that's for the birds. Then he finds out in a poll that people say, what? We think carbon dioxide, global warming is important. He says, oh, wait, wait a minute, I, I didn't really mean that. What I really meant is that we're going to have our own program for this. And time and time again, he announces a position. Position doesn't go down very well. And he alters the position a little bit in order to indicate that uh, he's leading the parade, having found out which way the parade is going. <laughs> I want to give you a slightly longer perspective on all of this, because at my age, all I really have is a long perspective. <laughs> what is so different, not just about President Bush, but what is so different about our politicians and state people today compares with those of a generation <clears throat> or two generations ago. Well, you notice something that almost anybody who runs for office today and hopes to make it reasonably good looking, has a reasonably good voice. You couldn't ever expect, for example, no matter how brilliant he was, that a person who stammers, for example, could be elected to a high office in this country. Because the television generation has turned politics into a stage, and all these people are merely players on this stage. And somehow the public suspects that this is something which is not really true, and not really, it's not real, but whatever it is, they, they can say the right things and do the right things to be appealing. What I contrast this with is what I've written in my book. This is a segue. <laughs> <clears throat> what I've written in my book is some of, of the giants of the previous generations. I mean, anybody who knew Winston Churchill, for example, who did in fact stammer a little bit, uh, but anybody who knew Winston Churchill, anybody who knew, seen Franklin Roosevelt, known Jack Kennedy at all, or even Nixon, whom I'll get to in a minute, would say these were stalwart people. You liked them, you didn't like them, you'd be for them or against them, but you know who they were. And the problem is that our politicians today, you don't really know who they are because they don't really mean for you to know who they are. They ask their handlers, um, what do people want to hear from me? They ask the script writers, write me the script that will reply to that. And then you will get that. So if I say to you my first impression of President Bush is, first of all, that he seems to be able to dance back and forth. He'll take a position which say, ah, that's the real Bush, and a week later he will alter that because he found it has not gone down very well. That didn't used to happen. That did not used to happen. The previous generations, they would come out there, if you like what they had to say, you voted for them, but that's who they were. And that is what I've lost here somewhere. I guess it may well be that, that President George Bush, I have never met him in person. Uh, although I wonder, you know, with all you see on television and all, whether it's necessary to meet them anymore. You, you know, it, really, it really was so very, very different. Nixon. <clears throat> I'm supposed to have been, I mean, I was number 17 on, on the White House under Nixon list of enemies. I found out that I was on the list of, <laughs> I found out that I was on that list of enemies in a very strange way. Uh, we were covering CBS, the other networks were covering the Senate Watergate hearings uh, being conducted by Chairman Sam Irvin. And we were stationed right outside the Senate caucus room where the hearings were going on because we were going gavel to gavel every day with these hearings. And the times they would break for five or 10 minutes, we'd run out and stand in front of the camera. And uh, all three of us, there was Sam Donaldson, to ABC to my left, and there was Douglas Kiker, the late Douglas Kiker, NBC to my right. And I was in there, each one looking at his camera and trying to tell his own network, frequently spilling over and being heard on the other network at the same time, but that, that was one of the small uh, technical problems we faced. And there was one day uh, in June 1973, John Dean, the White House counsel who had jumped ship, was the witness, and he was saying that he'd warned Nixon that there was a cancer on the presidency, and then he was asked some questions, and he said, yes, 
They did maintain a list of people that, whom they called their enemies. He was asked, do you have copies of those? Yes, he submitted them in evidence, but he didn't read them. So I, with a little thing in my ear, connected with CBS headquarters, control room, and next thing I heard was, hey, find out who those names are. Who are the enemies? <laughs> sure, right away. And, and <laughs> pretty soon somebody came up and handed to each one of the three of us a, the first list of enemies. We were all in a big hurry to beat the other by one or two seconds getting it on the air. Let's go, let's go. I got it, I got it, let's go. And, and, and there I was on the air. I had no, had no chance to look at it before going on the air. <clears throat> and I said, so here it is. It is, it is a memorandum from John Dean to H.R. Haldeman, subject on screwing our political enemies. <laughs> um, it is a, a numbered list of 20. And here they are. And I began reading the list, one, two, three, four, five. And then at number 17, it said, Daniel Shore, <laughs> notation, a real media enemy. And I really felt like fainting. I mean, I, 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 and suppose all I could do to say, um, number 18 is Paul, <clears throat> number 18 is Paul Newman. Uh, <laughs> Number 19 is Mary McGrory, and I forget who number 21, and now back to you. <laughs> right? and, and, and then I found out that he also did another thing. He didn't like a commentary. I'll tell you what, what, what it was about. Um, one night he went to New York and to deliver a speech to the Knights of Columbus, Catholic lay organization. Speech was written for him by his speechwriter, a man named Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Heard of him? <laughs> yeah, yes. And in this speech, that he said that the recent Supreme Court decision which denied federal funds to parochial schools was unfortunate but that he, President Nixon, would see to it that in spite of that, that there would be federal assistance to the parochial schools. And so my CBS editor said, why don't you get on the air and do an analysis of what it is they're going to do? What are their plans? So I made a lot of telephone calls and spoke to people in the government, to the Catholic school lobby, all of whom said unanimously that they weren't going to do anything. There were no plans. There was nothing that could work. And so I got on the air and I said, after this, speech, I, I, I said just that. Uh, we've tried to investigate as far as we can find out. There isn't any plan that would give federal money to the parochial schools, and all one can assume is that this is being done for political and rhetorical effect. <laughs> well, Pat Buchanan didn't like my saying that, and, and uh, the White House called me and uh, said that I was wrong, and I said, well, convince me. I went to the White House. It did not convince me, so I got on the air again. And so they try to convince me, but no, there's nothing there. Now, as I learned a long time later, as I learned a long, long time later, Pat Buchanan said to the President Nixon, why don't we get this son of a bitch? Why don't we get J. Edgar Hoover after him? And so they called J. Edgar Hoover, and they said that the boss, the President, wants some background stuff on a correspondent named Dan Shore. And it appears that the FBI misconstrued what was being asked for, because the word background at the FBI refers to a check of a person who's being considered for a government appointment. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they opened this wide open investigation, sending agents to interview my family, my bosses. An FBI uh, agent came to interview me. Uh, <clears throat> I asked what this is about. He said, well, sir, you, you must know this is for a position of trust and confidence. <laughs> the United States government, I, 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 it's hard to believe, but... <laughs> and and, and uh, finally, I said, I think I'd like to find out what the position is before we go further. <laughs> he reported back to FBI, I didn't know a position. FBI reported to the White House that they didn't know a position. They said, what do you mean position? I mean, <laughs> And they called off the investigation. <laughs> and in the end, when, when the, the House Judiciary Committee was considering impeachment of President Nixon, they drew up a list of uh, articles of impeachment, three of them. Number two was abuse of power. And under abuse of power 
uh, there was the unauthorized, unwarranted investigation of a journalist by the FBI, Daniel Shore. So there I was, <clears throat> becoming a little bit of history, and had the impeachment gone on, the trial and so on, who knows, I might have had to testify, but never mind, he resigned and he went away, and that was the end of that, and I thought that would be the end of my association with President Nixon um, for, for the next 20 years while he tried to work for his own rehabilitation. He worked very hard, he wrote books on history, went to the Soviet Union, came back, <clears throat> gave reports, wanted very much to be accepted as an elder statesman, and to some extent succeeded, even becoming kind of a pal of President Clinton, who consulted him at some points. But I had not seen him until 20 years later, a few years before his death, when he came back from the Soviet Union and made a speech giving a report on his trip, and I was invited to the dinner where he made the speech. The first time I'd seen him since he left office. And um, when the dinner was over, I could not resist going up to him and saying, Mr. Nixon, I don't know if you'll remember me, but, um, and he turned and said, sure, sure, Dan, sure, of course I remember you. Damn near hired you once. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> Could Bush do that? <laughs> I mean, it's a long story, and maybe and I'm taking time. For, I know you love to ask questions, and I'll give you whatever chance I can. But I just want you to know that they were giants back there. They were good, they were bad, but they were persons. They were persons. And my complaint about the first impression of the Bush administration is that they're not persons. They're constructions. They're computer generated. <laughs> so let, 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 let me stop there because I'm taking up your time. I want to give you a chance to find out what's on your mind. So, how do we do this? Thank you very much, Daniel Storr. I'm sure I could speak for everybody here that we could listen for hours. But we'll ask questions. <laughs> My question comes from a book uh, written in 1967 by your friend, Fred Friendly, mm -hmm. uh, friend and colleague. Um, his, the quote is, the correspondent unwilling to get mud on his shoes or pick up an amoeba bug in Asia or get hit by a beer can in Mississippi is not a journalist, but a narrator. So my question is, what would you, how would you see the evolution of this journalist versus narrator over the last 35 years? And where are we? Okay, I get an exemption because of my age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but having said that, uh, Fred had, as he usually does, he had a point. He sometimes overstates it, but I think he had... <clears throat> But, but, but I th think he had a very important point there. <clears throat> we now have a graduated series of people, say, in television news. You have uh, researchers, you have producers, you have directors. I'll leave out the makeup artists also. But the point is that a very important star in television today appears at the apogee of a large group of people and doesn't have the time and is too expensive day by day. It's too expensive to send out into muddying his feet or all the rest of it. You can have younger people do that and they will come back and they will put the thing together in a beautiful th piece of tape and this, the great journalist will then narrate that and maybe fly there <clears throat> just to stand for two minutes in front of something which you won't have to do much longer because we can do that now by computer. We can put a person anywhere. I mean, let me not digress too much, but I don't know if you remember about four years ago, Cokie Roberts uh, was standing on the steps of the Capitol on a Sunday morning giving a report on what was happening in Congress and with a coat on because it was cool there. Uh, and it turned out that she wasn't on the steps of the Capitol. She was in her studio. 
And by a magic of putting her against a blue flat and then another blue flat, I won't go into the technicalities since I don't know them, uh, <clears throat> uh, it becomes possible to send people, put people where you want to put them. So what's the use of having to go there <laughs> when technology will take you there? And so yes, Fred has a point. The idea of getting out with a, with a cameraman be with you and slugging through the mud and all the rest of it, it's going out of style. You have uh, young assistants who do the legwork. The journalist, if you call him that, call her that, gets the credit. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Uh, Mr. Shore, and I uh, resist the temptation to uh, refer to you as Dan, it's so familiar you seem to those of us who are NPR cool. junkies. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the Bush administration has been characterized by some as run on a corporate model with a loosely engaged chairman presiding over a group of disciplined managers. Another administration that has been characterized in that way is the Eisenhower administration, and I'd like to get your comments on whether there are similarities between the two. I do think there's a similarity uh, between the two, um, in, in the sense that neither, neither of them had and has the stomach for the nitty-gritty of governing. And so it is really much easier, uh, actually in the case of, of Eisenhower, the model was more military than business, I thought. But military and business, as we know, can come together very rapidly in this country. Uh, 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 maybe I better not say that in the Northwest. <coughs> uh, and, and, and I, it's true. Now, it's certainly the two, they do brag at the White House now that they run a very tight ship in the White House now. What does that mean? It means that, that you arrive on time, you have a meeting, and the meeting ends on time. And <clears throat> if the president isn't there, uh, if, if his chief executive officer will be there, uh, who is the vice president, and they take pleasure in that and, and, and pointing that out. But what they're also pointing out is they don't have somebody what I keep thinking of when I see these people conduct this very well-run tight ship is how the ship will run when there's a real crisis. When we had a Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy did not say in 1962, did not say, uh, give me a memo on that, we'll talk about that, I don't know what Khrushchev thinks about that, but let me know in, pa in one page or less uh, what the, my options are, like A, B, and C. Chances are I'll take B. But, whatever, whether I, but when you th think of, of Kennedy on Cuban Missile Crisis or Johnson on Vietnam uh, and how the president said, I'm the president, I better know a lot more about this. I want to know whether President Bush will be getting so deeply involved even if the meeting runs over time. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my mic is working. I don't care about yours. What's going on with media? What's going on with, with, with media is a, is a revolution, partly technological and partly economic. What's going on is that if I <clears throat> would, were a reporter uh, before television was invented, and I really was alive before television was invented, uh, in fact saw the first demonstration of experimental television at the New York World's Fair in 1939, but the age of television has changed the nature of, uh, of journalism in, in very important ways. And the result of that is that today, 
people who understand television and its workings have an enormous amount of power. Um, the communications revolution makes it much easier to report things, but it makes it much easier to, to manipulate the reporting. And the White House in particular, and industry and government in general, have learned that the, the spin, all these things that you hear about, in which you try to influence not only the, what you are telling, but, you, but the influence the reaction to what you're telling, influence how it all comes out. Journalism has always been a race between those who want to penetrate what's going on and those who would rather that if you do penetrate what's going on, you present it the way they want. In that race today, thanks to technology, thanks to a whole generation of consultants and experts, the people who would manipulate are ahead in the race against those who would try to resist manipulation. And I don't know how that will end. Yes, ma'am. Heather Komet, City Club member. Uh, my question is this. I, recently, President Bush addressed the Naval Academy at the commencement yes. ceremony. One of the things that he told the graduating midshipmen was that somebody with a C average could be successful. So, now, sorry, say again. somebody with a C average yes. could be successful. Could be now, president. <laughs> that, that was his point. That may be um, different from successful. And I, <laughs> <laughs> So my question is this, not, not making any comment on whether grades are indicative of ability. Um, I'm willing to accept reasonably good looks. I'm willing to accept a reasonably good voice. I'm wondering if you believe they have replaced reasonably good intelligence. Reasonably good intelligence. And how we might be able to um, promote politicians that are somehow held accountable on more than a, on an artificial media level. Right. It, was that speech at the Naval Academy or Yale? You're right, I'm sorry, it was at Yale. Right. And it had to be at Yale because it was a joke about his career at Yale. Mm -hmm. and had Where to, he had dropped. And he was making the joke about his C average and so on and so right. on. Okay. And then his vice president had dropped out. <clears throat> um, th there are words that, that you hear today which I didn't, not, it didn't even understand when I was young and I'm not sure I understand today. There's that big word, virtual. There's a thing called virtual reality. And, um, and we frequently don't know whether, what the connection is between virtual reality and real reality. Or are we losing real reality? Or is the public content with a semblance of things as opposed to, to things that really are or that really were? And I, 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 I repeat your question, because I, in the course of developing my answer, I lost the question. <laughs> How, how might we hold our politicians up to some litmus test where we can put them beyond the, the media artificial of good voice and good looks? All right. If you can take a politician and take away those two things that stand there before him, like little plastic things that seen from your side, but from his side they are a teleprompter. And he can look left and right and say, you know, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking so on and so forth and see this word spinning down there. If you can take, a, if you can take away the people who write the speech, take away the teleprompter from what you read the speech, if you can force somebody to appear before you just as a person, you're on your way to finding out something. But don't stand on one foot waiting for it to happen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Joe Smith, City Club. I want to assure you it's okay to criticize the military industrial complex in the Northwest now because they're moving to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and you left out a third necessary quality for a politician today. If he is male, he has to have lots of hair. True. <laughs> My uh, question. Oh, uh, how bitter you seem. <laughs> Recent experience. <laughs> as, as you communicate with the folks who have an opportunity to observe the, the president closely, we all recognize the remarkable contrast between what he says and what he does. Is it your impression that he believes what he is saying when he says it, or does he recognize the contradiction? That's an interesting question, because I do believe that in the end, people may 
take positions which are written for them and handed to them, and in the end come to believe their own words. That makes it much easier, at least you don't feel like a hypocrite. Um, uh, but I must say uh, that sometimes I will listen to President Bush making a speech, and he may believe what's in that speech, but reads as though he's not sure what he's saying. Uh, there's a way of emphasizing now and then the wrong word, and you sort of, no, 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 Mr. President. With the, the word you want to emphasize here is, because that contrasts with the other part of it, I would be willing to say that uh, no president, uh, do, there's no president who doesn't end up believing what he has said, even if he didn't write it, except I'm beginning to wonder, except I'm beginning to, to wonder about, starting with President Bush and a great many, uh, you hear them, you know not only that they didn't write that speech, but they apparently didn't read it very carefully before, <laughs> before getting out to say it. And so, but to answer your question, um, if the president doesn't believe what he says today, he'll believe it tomorrow when it's explained to him. <laughs> Afternoon, Mr. Shaw, Irwin Mandel, City Club member. You've painted a picture of our politicians scripted by their handlers and following their teleprompters. You've also painted a picture of our correspondents standing in front of computer-generated backgrounds with their scripts and handlers. Are there any real people left in public life? Yes, they're all over 80. 